Thank you so much for the talk. It was great. It's always good to to hear uh, the history of ideas, put them in a context, and understand what was the interests and the circumstances that make people think that way. Um, and uh, I would like to, I would like to hear your comments on two topics. Uh, one, uh, we heard in a seminar previously that uh, the transition would be like a new revolution, a new industrial revolution. But instead of being led by uh, technological breakthroughs, it would be policy-led. I would like to hear what, what is your view in this, uh, in this idea. And also, a second point, um, like talking about emissions and climate governance and so, uh, there is the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. And uh, I'm glad you, you just mentioned the necessity of uh, f uh, transferring funds and uh, f uh, financing a uh, new energy uh, structure uh, in worldwide. And thinking of that, uh, I, I was thinking, do you f uh, we address this issue right now with the Paris Agreement nationally, right? Each country saying what is its contribution and so. But there is the issue that countries import materials uh, and uh, actually who is responsible for these emissions? The countries that demand these materials for imports, uh, demand this energy transformation uh, from, uh, from foreign countries, or the countries that are producing them and they are also profiting it, uh, from it in their economies. So who is actually responsible for those emissions in one side and the other side your, comment, your comments about the transition? Uh, okay, um, about who is responsible, uh, from what I read, for instance, if you take China, uh, now the, by far the biggest part of the emission is linked to the domestic economy. I mean, of course, it's a major exporter of industrial goods. I mean, it's not to, to, uh, to say that they are not imported. I mean, for France, for instance, it's a big uh, importer of uh, CO2 emissions. If you take the national emissions, uh, France is a rather uh, a good uh, example. You, are, you have six tons per capita per year, but if you take the emissions from imported goods from all over the world, I mean, not only China, but Germany and uh, all over the world, it's 11 tons, which means that the CO2 emissions in, in France have stagnated. It has not decreased. Whereas if you take the uh, national emission, it has decreased, okay? So, I mean, it can be very important for, for certain countries. Um, but, I mean, so what, what do you want me to say? Um, for instance, we should talk, instead of talking about nuclear plants or windmills or solar panels, uh, we should talk about the foreign trade of France. That would be an interesting discussion to have. Uh, in, in economic policy. Probably more important, far more important on climate than if we're going to put nuclear plants, uh, 10, 14 new reactors. I, mean that, that, I think that would be an interesting discussion to have. Then who is responsible for uh, the emissions? You can make different calculations, but for the really big industrial countries such as China, uh, it, it, it won't change so much. You will reduce it uh, a little bit, but most of the, for instance, the production of cement, the production of steel, it is consumed locally for the huge development of infrastructure uh, in, in China. So I think for a long, for a long period of time, this idea of uh, exported emission has also been used as a way of saying, you know, uh, some countries are not really responsible for their emissions, but now it's become less and less uh, effective as, a, as an argument. And for the, sorry? Um, I mean, it should be policy-led. But when you look at the history of technology, I mean, what matters is really the evolution of technologies, for instance, for the, the development of more efficient uh, technologies. And most of the time, there are inventions. First of all, I mean, the history of efficiency is behind us. It's not in front of us. I mean, if there is something strange, I had uh, actually a slide on that, but if you take the production of uh, steel, there's a recent article in Nature which has come, come out. Um, steel production has not improved in terms of CO2 emission for a century. 
for the scope one, for the, I mean, really the, the not because then you have the, you use electricity and this has improved, but for the basic production of steel, it has not improved. It has improved a little bit in the 1920s and 1930s, but then it has stagnated. And you can find that in many different technologies for production of cement, the rotary kilns, they are the same kind of technology. They are bigger, they are more efficient, uh, but they are not radically different. And in the end, they, they, they are probably not uh, great uh, efficiency uh, to, be, to, be, to, to, to be gained in the future. So, um, so why, why, why did I say that? Just to tell you that the, the real policy would be really a policy of degrowth, I mean, of, de of decreasing the consumption of these materials. I don't know if it is possible. I have no idea, especially on a global scale, but it's really the only reasonable way of, of, of uh, imagining a way to limit the, the, the emission of such, uh, of such uh, technologies. Uh, if it's a new industrial revolution, no, I think, the, I mean, first of all, the first industrial revolution has always, it has been debunked since the 70s by historians, that economic growth is stronger in the 18th century than it is in many ways in the early 19th century, for instance, in Britain. Uh, so there have been so many critiques of industrial revolution that I, I wouldn't use that as a metaphor. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. That was really, really uh, fascinating, just the, the history of those concept and how the concept of energy transition has really been uh, well used to slow it down. That was really, really nice to, to hear how you uh, put that down. Um, I also just, I'm going to, I was going to talk about degrowth, but you just kind of uh, took part of my question already. We, that is kind of the answer. We can't really do anything else but that if we're looking at this massive addition of, of energy use. Um, but I'm going to talk about something which you just mentioned as well about the 1.5 degrees. Mm -hmm. So in my position, I've liked this shift from talking about, oh, we only want two degrees to 1.5 because it's really made apparent the massive difference in impact climate breakdown mm -hmm. will have, whether we're at 1.5 or two, will have a massive, mm -hmm. massive difference. And millions of people, yeah. But at the same time, I kind of get what you're, you're trying to get at, and I just wanted to ask you whether it's this, that we're, we're actually still headed for, with the Climate Action Tracker now, for 2.7 degrees, mm -hmm. if we're lucky, mm -hmm. and whether the, the discourse about 1.5 makes people think, oh, everything is going to be fine, whereas the, the reality is still the kind of three degrees environment that we're, we're heading to. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether you, want, uh, whether you can just perhaps elaborate that and on, on sufficiency and degrowth. I was just wondering whether you could elaborate a bit about these kind of ideas you had earlier about that we need 50 years for these transitions to happen. Um, I feel that we can become much, much faster when we really take up degrowth and run with it and really get rid of coal, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. And actually Germany now is aiming to do it by 2030, mm -hmm. which is already yeah, right. cutting it in half. Yeah. Um, still too slow, but mm. we, I think we can get a lot faster there with this concept, and I just want to hear... Can you just remind me your first question the very briefly? Yeah, yeah, the 1.5 degrees. Yeah, the 1.5 degrees, yeah. sorry. Uh, so the 1.5 report, um, I mean, why I think it's, uh, it was not necessarily a, a good idea, because if, when you looked at the scenarios, I mean, you had a curve like this of emission of CO2 uh, in the history, and suddenly you would have a drop, a kind of cliff like this. Okay? And the only way, actually, for 1.5 degree to be possible is if you use BEX technology, bioenergy, carbon capture, and storage. The idea is you use biomass to produce energy, and at the same time, you capture the CO2 from the plant and you put it under the soil. Okay, so I mean, this is a non existent technology which should have to be massively deployed right now. I mean, it's just it's completely meaningless. So, I think it is a shame that uh, an IPCC report put forward this kind of vision which are completely unrealistic. So, I think it is important to have you know some respect for expertise for and, and the fact that this kind of expertise is mixed with serious climatology for me, it's a serious problem. 
um, so, so I understand the point of to show that each uh, tens, tens of a degree matter. That I understand your point, and you're entirely right. And it was interesting to see that you would have not uh, 20 but uh, 100 million people displaced by uh, the rise, the rise, the, the rise of uh, the, the water, and so, so that, that, that's important, of course, to 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 to, to have this idea in mind. But at the same time, it was really an exercise in technological utopia, which I thought was uh, not, not very interesting. And for degrowth, uh, I mean, in a way, it's kind of pessimistic, but when you think seriously about it, you can see that degrowth will just slow the problem. Because in many respects, it's about also food production. It's going to be difficult to produce food without fertilizers. And fertilizers emit um, nitrate oxides, which warm the climate. So there, I mean, there, are, there are plenty of sectors that you can't really, really degrow. I mean, it's, uh, oh, it's difficult. I mean, right, um, or you could, I mean, of course, if you consume less meat and so on, you, you, that, I'm not saying that it is uh, impossible, but uh, so, I mean, the, the danger is also to present degrowth as a panacea and not look at the different technologies, uh, the one after the other. If you see, I don't know if you see what I mean. I mean, to, to degrowth should not be a way to close the debate, saying this is the solution, or because it's just part of the solution. I mean, uh, and technology is also very important as well. I mean, it's not uh, the one or the other. So, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not a very clear answer. I, I, I understand that. But uh, sometimes when you when I have a discussion with a promoter of degrowth, which I, I sympathize, of course, with the idea, but uh, they have to understand that even that is n it's not enough. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a far more radical and deep problem, which is, I mean, extremely difficult to solve. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, my name is Raman. I come from, from Belarus. And um, um, I really enjoy the topic, the, the debates on, on green transition and energy efficiency. Uh, because uh, in my country, we are still struggling even with uh, waste recycling on an individual level. And uh, the way that we are trying to solve now the uh, energy independence issue is we're building a nuclear plant uh, which we had an issue with Lithuania over because they don't like the idea that we are going to build it uh, next to them and uh, we are the country that uh, was most one of the countries that was most affected by Chernobyl of so I wanted to ask you about your attitude to nuclear energy uh, because we had um, we had a seminar from some other professor whose name unfortunately I don't remember, and he said that it is um, it doesn't make any sense for France to give up nuclear energy from its new uh, from its uh, energy mix, because you have a lot of experience with this type of energy, and uh, to follow up on that, also I heard today the interview by Yannick Jadot. And uh, he made a very straightforward point. He said that we are going to tax everything, uh, whatever is not good for the well-being, we are going to tax it. And whatever is good for the well-being, like biofoods or renewable energies, I don't remember if he said that they are going to subsidize it, but for sure they are not going to tax it. So the second question would be, uh, what do you think about the chances of the Greens winning in the French presidential election. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, if you can comment on this, I'm, I'm just okay. really curious. Uh, the, the second question is quite fi easy to answer. Uh, that's true. Uh, for, for the first question, I'm, I'm, no, I, I'm not an expert on this topic. and. I just noticed that uh, nuclear energy 
has been promoted for now more than uh, 60 years or 70 years actually and uh, it is still completely marginal in the global energy mix mm -hmm. and when you read the, the scientists of the, of the 60s they always explain that really the crucial technology is the fat breeder reactor the fission uh, the, the simple fission reaction is not enough it's producing such an amount of, uh, of uh, dangerous waste and uranium is not uh, an unlimited resource so you really need fast breeder reactor fast breeder reactor you know there have been different projects that have never worked so I got the feeling that yes yeah, it's a kind of dead end it has been a dead end for a long time and so uh, my feeling would be that it won't play a major role on a global scale it is so expensive uh, it can be important for rich countries or powerful industrial countries where with a, with a stable state with an important flow of public investment because of course no private investment wants to go in uh, massively in, uh, in EDF or this kind of uh, company so I mean it's uh, well I mean the, the feeling is that we have tried and tried and tried again and it has not really uh, changed a lot the global energy mix even the French energy mix for electricity it is important but for, for the rest no I mean when you look at CO2 emissions of France it has decreased uh, in the 80s thanks to nuclear plants but at a very slow pace you know? I mean it's not uh, it's not radically different in terms of uh, CO2 emissions in the end so for all these reasons I mean it's it won't be the technological panacea that uh, is sometimes presented but actually even nuclear promoters of nuclear energy do agree on that I mean if you take the there has been an important report called the RTE RTE is the um, company which distributes electricity in France and they have made a very interesting report which you can I mean you can read the summary it's very clear and what they explain is that um, in, I mean, you, you, you need an energy mix which is dominated by renewables. In any, I mean, you can't have an energy mix dominated by nuclear plants in the future. I mean, just for the simple reason that it is difficult to build up nuclear plants at a fast enough rate to satisfy the energy needs. Recently, there was also um, an interview by uh, the director in the Monde three days ago of the national security and uh, um, ISN the, 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 the authority on nuclear safety in France and he said that to produce the nuclear plants the 14 nuclear plants uh, in the, that, that might be programmed the nuclear energy sector would need to recruit 4,000 engineers a year in the next 10 or 20 years I can't remember 4,000 engineers it's an enormous amount of engineers I mean it's a uh, a lot of engineers. I'm not sure there are so many engineers wanting to work uh, in, the, in the nuclear sector in the future in France. So I mean w what is more and more evident is that uh, when you look in, in the detail in the, in the fact that nuclear plants are not so reliable, the fact that you know you've got uh, huge problems of corrosion in different tubes, tubing systems in French nuclear plants, all this make it not such a palatable uh, solution I think. Uh, and and clearly not uh, on the global scale it won't be very important it's actually what Cesare Malchetti discovered to his great disappointment he was really sad when he realized that nuclear, nuclear energy won't be so important at least uh, in his lifetime now you have the easy question sorry? you have the second easy question <laughs> no I mean <laughs> ok uh, It's just a quick, quick follow-up um, to what Ramon was saying about the kind of the nuclear phase-out and these these plans that go uh, that these kind of energy transition plans, such as from uh, Nigawat. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering what you were thinking about these that do really envision some kind of substitution of fossil fuels in the next 
be it more 30 years, but still. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, first of all, they imagine a very strong decrease in the energy consumption, which might, I mean, it's, it might be possible, it's very optimistic. Uh, and second, they rely a lot on biomass. When you look at their reports, wow, they, you seem that you need a lot of wood to, to power the French uh, industry. So I don't know what it means precisely for the forest and so on and so forth. So what I noticed is that uh, Amory Lovins also explained that biomass could replace fossil fuels, for instance. Oh, we, um, oil, oil. Well, it has never happened and it will never happen. I mean, it's, uh, so, I mean, one of the risks is also to have a kind of, um, you, you have a kind of, uh, technophile vision of transition, you can very easily have a kind of uh, ecolo utopia, ecological utopia of transition. This idea that you can also return to something uh, in the past, like biomass and so on and so forth, which is dubious, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Jean-Baptiste.